I'm here in my podcast studio downtown in Tallinn, Estonia. I needed to get out of the house. And a few weeks ago, I found a very special monitor that I wanted to tell you about. Part of my job in Estonia is I'm an events host. So let's say there's a conference or a dinner or something like that. I'll be the, the, the dude who makes the announcements and leads through the evening. And I was hosting a green tech conference all that stuff is streamed these days. So there's a huge backstage with tech crew, audio, visual, the whole thing. And as I went to the backstage, something caught my eye. I was like, is that a, is that a D-series BVM? What the? And I got closer and I realized, wait, 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 wait. This thing's flat. And it's an OLED flat screen 1080p PVM. And I've never seen one of these things in the wild before. And I was excited. I wanted to make a video for y'all. So let's do it. So in this video, I'm gonna just view it from the perspective of a retro gamer and all the things we might like to do. Uh, I'm gonna, I've got a time sleuth. We're gonna do all the lag tests that you could hope for. And we're gonna see, is this a reasonable monitor to use for your retro gaming? Could be, if you got the cash. So let's start with a little Trinitron history. It's called PVM, right? PVM and BVM do not just mean CRT. They literally stand for Professional Video Monitor and Broadcast Video Monitor. And since Sony uh, first manufactured a Trinitron back in around 1968 or so, they've always been at the cutting edge of TV technology. And you're looking around the mid 90s into the year 2000s, it's clear that everything is moving towards flat screen technology. Sony shifts their R&D efforts towards flat screen stuff. And then uh, they produced the first LCD PVM in 2006. And then by 2011, they had upgraded that to an OLED model. And that's the one we're seeing here. Uh, this one was produced in the late 2011. Now, I think that it cost around 5,000 US dollars when it first came out. I'm not sure. Please check me out and help me out if uh, you know the exact answer. Now, there was a BVM variant of this same monitor and the BVM variant has exactly the same OLED panel in it. So it's just the hardware and the firmware that's driving it that is different. However, the BVM variant would have set you back $16,000 back in the day. That's three or even four times as much for the, the BVM variant for exactly the same panel. And it gives you a very interesting insight into the way this technology works. The unit can be controlled by a, a separate control unit, a IP remote, or just using the buttons on the bottom of the screen because it's a PVM. You can select your inputs, press one of the seven programmable action buttons, and then menu control. On the back, we've got the inputs. We've got two SDI, one composite, and one HDMI. The PVM sticker looks suitably Sony Pro Monitor-like, very authentic. The PVM does handle audio as many PVMs in the CRT era did. The small built-in speaker will play the sound from your HDMI, SDI, or the 3.5 millimeter line in. This particular screen came with a solid rental case. That's the one the company provides. It was a bit loose inside, but it was fine from moving it to worksite to worksite. Absolutely stunning. It looks tremendous. I was testing this with my mister, the HDMI going to the screen and composite using Antonio Villena's adapter going out to a nine inch BVM. Now the BVM looks great. It's a little sharp, but composite compensates for that a little bit looking really nice. But then somehow when I was, I was doing this editing and doing this script writing, my eye would always just start to drift slowly over to the OLED and it's, it's stunning. The blacks are super black. It's got this lovely matte screen and these pixels, crisp, crispy, crispy pixels. Pixels so crispy, Colonel Sanders and his 11 herbs and spices wouldn't have E. It's amazing, okay? Mwah. No, it does not. I've tried sending in a 240p signal into the composite input and it wouldn't even recognize. It doesn't even see it as a signal. The way that I could kind of get it to work was I used the mister with the output of composite. And then I started with 
480i, I ran that into the composite of the monitor. It worked just fine. And then using the software, I switched it over to 240p and then it continued on okay. I guess it was continuing to see 240p as 480i and could continue on. But the lesson that I take from this is this monitor is not meant for 240p. I know we're all the CRT guys at home. We're like, oh, the good old days, the Sony techs, the TriMaster technicians, the Trinitron geniuses, they love 240p just as much as we do. They definitely would have put it in anything that has a PVM, PVM. No, no. Uh, I don't think they were thinking about that stuff. This unit definitely doesn't handle 240p. If you want to send a retro signal into this monitor, upscale it. It is a beautiful screen. When you send in a nice, crisp, clear 1080 screen, you will get wonderful results. Let's go over the lag test results. 480i over HDMI gave us 7.7 .7 milliseconds. 480p over HDMI, 7.3 milliseconds. 720p was 6.9 milliseconds. And 1080p is 6.8 milliseconds. All things considered, you can take these results as being identical. And what's also interesting is 480i, the interlaced mode was exactly the same as the progressive, meaning the deinterlacing of this monitor is very quick and won't slow you down at all. Testing 240p was gonna be a lot harder because my time sleuth doesn't output 240p. I can't seem to reflash it. I've got a USB blaster, but it keeps blue screening my PC. So I had to come up with some other MacGyver solution. And I eventually settled on using, the only thing I had, a HDMI to AV adapter. Now, when I put that up to a CRT, this thing alone shows between 20 and 30 milliseconds of variable lag. So anywhere between two to three frames of variable lag, this thing will produce. So now when I put that up to the PVM, we're seeing 90 plus milliseconds. Again, we're seeing it variable, but about 90 milliseconds of lag, take out the 30 from the device and you've got something around 60 milliseconds of lag through this port. This is my deduction. So I deduce that the composite port has about four frames of lag on it. Look, it's not something you wanna be using. It seems to be a bit of a backup. Uh, if you are in a broadcast setting, the composite may not be your primary. It's more like a secondary viewing monitor. So that's the end of the review. Thanks for watching the video. This monitor is just tremendous. Those deep blacks, the matte screen is beautiful. These crisp colors that come up, they're so sharp and clear, but goddamn, this thing gonna cost you a pretty penny if you want it in your home. Five grand new, maybe about three grand these days for a 1080p screen, but by God, it looks amazing. Connect it to your favorite scaler, send it in a crisp 1080p signal, maybe from a retro tink or maybe directly from your Mr. FPGA and you will not have a bad time, I promise you. So thanks very much. Thanks for enjoying the Cathode Ray podcast. If you wanna see more content from me and Steve from Retro Tech, check out the links that are on the screen right now. Thanks for watching, see you next time.